it's additional uh, to what we really need to do. Okay, so we've got a few minutes now just to run through some basic thermometers. Now, the perfect gas thermometer is, as I've said, the only one to give us access to um, the thermodynamic temperature scale. And it's because all the other thermometric properties we might look at have this issue that they are only approximate to straight lines over a particular temperature ranges. They do deviate from that otherwise. Whereas the pressure times volume in a gas, you know, that's not, not the case. Um, now, we technically, we have to talk about a perfect gas. Um, and we'll talk about perfect gases in some considerable detail in a week or two's time. Uh, but for now, <coughs> I can give you the basics. Um, a perfect gas just assumes that our gas molecules have zero size. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of other approximations that go in there as well. They have no attractive potential between them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, actually, in practice, if we've got a gas at relatively low pressure, so the distances between the gas molecules are quite large on average, um, pretty much any gas will behave to a very, very good approximation like a perfect gas. Right now, it breaks down eventually. Uh, nitrogen at some point, oxygen at some point will liquefy. Right? So we're no longer dealing with a gas. So there is a lower bound to how we might use those two. Helium and hydrogen are a lot more useful. Helium doesn't liquefy until we get down to just over four degrees above absolute zero. So helium's quite a useful gas. Hydrogen will go down there as well, uh, or almost down there. Um, so there are lots of gases we can use um, uh, to run this, and, and they are all based on this relationship that I gave you on the board earlier, that pressure times volume is proportional to absolute temperature. Right, when we get to the kinetic theory of gases, we'll talk about what that constant is. Um, but at the moment, you really don't need to, uh, need to know that. Right. Well, what does it look like? This is a fairly crude diagram of the same thing. And it's, it's using what we talked about yesterday in terms of hydrostatics measuring pressure. Right. So the basis of this is that we've got a reservoir of gas this bulb labelled B uh, on the diagram here. It's a crude diagram, but we have to assume that what's connecting it round to this, um, I'm guessing it's supposed to be a mercury manometer round here rather than any other fluid, uh, has minuscule <coughs> volume compared to the volume of the gas in there. Right? So we need to be able to ignore the volume in that tube. Uh, there are ways of compensating for this, but um, let's keep it simple for now. So this is the bit that's going to sit at our unknown temperature. All right? And pressure times volume is going to change as the temperature changes. Well, we're going to assume the volume is the same. So let's say pressure then in this bulb uh, B is going to reduce as the temperature reduces. Well, we know we can measure pressure. That's what we talked about yesterday. Uh, we can measure pressure just by looking at differences between uh, columns of mercury. And um, the way this works is basically this mercury reservoir is raised and lowered in order to keep this at a constant point. And you do that just because then you have got constant volume. But it's still the case that you can measure then the pressure inside here by measuring the height difference between these two exactly as we did yesterday. So it's just rho times g times h. Rho is the density of mercury in this case. You know, g is 9.81 meters per second squared, and that's what we measure as h. So this is a gas thermometer. This is what we would use to measure um, thermodynamic temperature. And this <coughs> is why we generally don't measure thermodynamic temperature because this is an incredibly cumbersome device. So what we use this for instead is calibrating much simpler to use thermometers. Okay, so this becomes a benchmark for the others. They might only be 
accurate over limited temperature regions, but we've got a whole slew of these different devices we can use in different temperature regimes. Um, so that's fine. We can, we can cover the whole scale, but each of those thermometers eventually owes its calibration back to a device like this. Okay, so this is now our core to the whole thing, and that's probably a good point to stop here. Um, and I've just got sort of half a dozen examples of thermometers that we'll, we'll pick up again uh, next time. Now remember, um, next week has odd timetable slots just like this week did. Um, this week, as of lunchtime, I'm going to be travelling up to Glasgow for a few days to the university there. Next week I've got a big meeting down in Swindon. Um, so we've, we've got a Monday lecture slot again, remember, and then the test on Tuesday. So we'll pick this up again on Monday. Last time we had a look at a gas thermometer, we talked about real gases being good approximations to perfect gases, providing you keep the pressure relatively low and so on. Um, and that a gas like hydrogen is, is actually fairly commonly used in these things. Helium uh, also is another one. Uh, and they're quite useful because they don't liquefy until really <coughs> quite low temperatures. So they stay a gas uh, until quite low down. So this has a very wide range. Um, and it is the calibration point for all other thermometers, as I was saying last week very much more common everyday sort of thermometer you'll have come across these I'm sure um, you will in the lab if you haven't elsewhere uh, but you know mercury is a useful liquid in the sense that we can stick it in a tube like this with a very narrow bore capillary <laughs> above a reservoir and all we need to do then is to follow the expansion of that liquid as, uh, as the temperature goes up so as its degree of hotness uh, its internal energy rises, uh, the atoms will vibrate on average slightly further apart, it'll expand, the only place it can go to expand is along this capillary uh, in uh, what is usually uh, a glass tube. And um, you know, they're, they're quite good, they cover a fairly good range, I mean everything you would want uh, in terms of everyday use, uh, and then some, um, and they can be quite accurate. Uh, as in reproducible, right? They are calibrated, remember, and, and owe their uh, ultimately owe their accuracy to a calibration back to a gas thermometer. But in and of themselves, uh, they're certainly reproducible to within, say, a tenth of a, of a degree. So you know, not bad, and relatively inexpensive. There are alternatives to mercury, of course. You may well have seen alcohol-based thermometers, usually with a sort of red dye put in the alcohol, so it's easier to see. Um, a little bit more precise still, different temperature re regime. This will go down to very low uh, temperatures, but it tends not to be able to operate to very high temperatures. Um, it's probably a bit conservative to say that it would run out at 123 degrees centigrade. It's too precise and too narrow. I just took that out of the textbook. You can get resistance to the monitors that would go higher than that, but not much. Um, but again, over a useful range in terms of doing science, uh, these things are actually really, really useful. And it's based on the fact that the resistance of a metal will vary with temperature. Um, and mostly vary linearly with temperature, which is, of course, what you want. Uh, remember, on the centigrade scale, we've only got two points, and we've just joined them up with a straight line and extrapolated that straight line off in both directions. So you really do need to be using a thermometric property that, that varies linearly uh, um, as closely as you can get it. A very common wire to use is platinum, and that's simply because uh, it does behave in terms of linear variations, and it's corrosion resistant. Right? You don't want your wire oxidizing. No point putting iron in there, for instance, because uh, the resistivity of rust is significantly different. Um, so. Um, classic setup is the one we've got on the board. It's a thin wire of platinum, 
um, usually dunked in something like an oil bath simply to give a uniform temperature distribution and to stop fast fluctuations of temperature. Um, so this isn't a quick response thing. And then you just need to measure the resistance of the wire. Um, now on this diagram, and for most high precision work, it goes through something called a Wheatstone bridge, which you may or may not have come across yet, and it doesn't matter. Uh, this is just a way of measuring resistance with some degree of precision. Okay, so next way of measuring temperature. This is our fourth <coughs> variant of the thermometer. Uh, a thermocouple. <coughs> thermocouple is really, oh gosh, lots of viruses going around the room. Um, thermocouples are very, very useful in the sense that they cover a fairly broad range. It'll depend on the wires you use. Uh, it's quite sensitive, um, very fast response rates and so on. These are the things, you know, I showed you an example of one uh, last week, but these are the things that you'll have, you know, controlling your fridge or your freezer or central, heater, uh, central heating boiler, that sort of stuff. Um, it relies on the fact that if you get two dissimilar metals in contact, uh, there'll be an EMF uh, developed between them, something called the Seebeck effect after this guy who in the late, uh, in the early, sorry, 19th century um, did all the first work on it. So for every junction in dissimilar metal you'll get an EMF produced. So if you go from metal A to metal B and then back to metal A again, you've now got two junctions between dissimilar metals. Now, if those two junctions are at the same temperature, you measure no voltage in your circuit. But as soon as one of them is at a different temperature to the other one, then the EMF generated at one junction is different to the EMF being generated in the opposite direction at the other one. So they no longer cancel out, and you get a net voltage measured in the circuit. So the setup for these is really, really, really straightforward. Uh, we keep <coughs> one junction in, say, melting ice as our reference junction, and then we simply measure the voltage that we pick up in our circuit as the other junction probes whatever it is we're trying to measure the temperature of. Um, so it's really, really straightforward. Uh, it's a voltmeter and some bits of wire. And I showed you my sort of lashed up one that I did for a lab demonstration uh, last week, I think. I had a bit of garden wire in the middle and some copper mains cable on the outside. Right? And the junction was just a connector box. Incredibly crude, <coughs> but it's a working thermocouple. So as long as I keep one of these junctions at a fixed temperature, and the conventional thing to do, as I say, is to put it in melting ice, then I can stick that junction wherever I like now to measure uh, whatever the unknown temperature is. Okay? So, and, you know, these are, these are really, again, quite sensitive, quite accurate. They need to be calibrated, of course, against some standard thermometer, like everything else. Uh, but there are now commercially available thermocouple wires. In fact, there have been for a long time commercially available thermocouple wires. Uh, where all that calibration has been done. So the wires are a standardized composition. So there are tables produced, lookup tables essentially. If you measure this, that, or the other voltage, then it corresponds to a temperature of. And these things are accurate to within 0.1, maybe even better uh, degrees. And in terms of changes of temperature, they're much more sensitive than that. So does that mean that there's a container somewhere in your fridge with? Melting no, the, the, because you don't need a precise measurement in a fridge, you just need to be you know, <coughs> in the right ballpark. Uh, they'll essentially have an electronic mock-up of melting ice. Um, so in the, you know, in the box out of which the thermocouple cable comes, uh, there's a circuit in there that, that mimics the sort of voltage you would get from a junction in melting ice. So it's a, you know, it's a it's a crude but effective uh, way around that problem. But if you're doing it precisely in the lab, then you would definitely need to have a reference junction that you could <coughs> trust, as it were. <coughs>
No, that's a good question. Um, the big advantage of these things, of course, is that you can make the wires very, very thin, so they're not going to be conducting a lot of heat <coughs> energy away from the object you're measuring. But also, that means the junction then contains a very small amount of metal, which means they'll respond very fast to changes in temperature, and that's one of their big, big strengths. Uh, if you've got fluctuating temperatures, these things can track the fluctuations. Uh, and do so very rapidly. And all you've got to do is measure a voltage, which is trivial, right? You can not only measure it, but log it. So again, these are really useful in terms of, of you know, quality control, well, like in the fridge, in fact, uh, over long periods of time. Um, they're very useful at that sort of thing. So as I say, there are some uh, there are all sorts of commercial pairs of wires out there uh, that are available. Nickel chromium is, is you know, one of at the sort of cheap end of the spectrum, as it were. Um, if you really wanted to go up to high temperatures, then a pair, you know, one branch of which was pure platinum and the other was a platinum rhodium alloy, uh, works very, very well. And those thermocouples you can use up to. Um, you know, at least 2,000 degrees centigrade. So they're, they're quite useful in, in oven and furnace type work and so on. Um, at least when the atmospheres aren't too corrosive. So that's the thermocouple. We'll come back to this later actually. Um, in fact, we'll come back to it next term even. Because uh, thermocouples are one of the ways in which you can measure um, infrared radiation, for instance. Uh, you just take your junction, junction one labelled on this diagram, um, and you flatten it out so it's got a relatively large surface area, and <coughs> you make sure that it's painted matte black, and it absorbs infrared, and you can use that then as, a, as an IR detector, essentially. Um, but as I say, we'll come to that next term. So, last <coughs> one I want to look at in terms of thermometers... <coughs> Uh, is the optical pyrometer, and this is the one that's going to take us up to really high temperatures. So, you know, steel works and so on will use optical pyrometers. Um, in fact, measuring surface temperature of, of the sun and other stars and so on is based on uh, optical pyrometry. Um, and it relies on the fact that as you heat an object up, it gives off radiation. Um, at lower temperatures, you can't actually see the radiation that's coming off with the naked eye because we're talking about infrared. All right, so the radiation coming off the radiator in your house, for instance, is infrared radiation. Um, you can detect it with, you know, nerve endings in the back of your hand, but you won't be seeing it on on your retina. But if we go beyond um, five, six, seven hundred degrees, then we we'll begin to see an object glowing. In other words, we're getting photons off in the visible part of the spectrum that we can detect. And the pyrometer is based on that higher temperature regime. Uh, and it works very simply. Uh, there's a filament in there through which you pass a current. So you heat it up. Right? Um, and all you really need to do then is to look at the object you're trying to measure the temperature of um, through a viewfinder that contains an image of that filament and you turn the current up in the filament, in other words you heat the filament up until it's giving off the same colour of light as the object you're trying to measure. In other words the filament disappears, you cannot detect it from the background. So when the filament disappears you know that it's at the same temperature as the inside of your furnace or whatever it's <coughs> looking at. So having <coughs> calibrated all of this beforehand, how much current corresponds to what temperature, so we've calibrated it back ultimately to a gas thermometer, um, then you have a measure just by you know, picking up the current going through the filament of what the temperature of this remote object must be. So it's a non-contact method. And for very high temperatures, that has you know, what I hope are self-evident advantages. Um, but as I say, that's, it's very good for that sort of, uh, sort of stuff. Um, there's just a few slides I want to show you to finish off, really. And these are, these are as much 
background information as anything. But there are no facts on here that I need you to remember. Uh, it's just um, you know, pad, uh, you know, padding out the story in the sense of giving you a fuller picture of what goes on. Because um, what we need, of course, are workable scales, workable thermometers, workable fixed points covering. Um, you know all the temperature regime uh, <coughs> that we're going to be interested in, and we've talked about thermometers already, <coughs> and the ranges they cover. That's fine, um, but you know we really need to get a bit practical about some other things. So even on the absolute scale, the thermodynamic scale, there is an issue because as we get close to absolute zero, we have no gases, right? They they all liquefy at some point. Right, even helium, which has a really low uh, liquefaction temperature of 4.2 degrees Kelvin, it's a liquid, it's not a gas anymore. Um, so we have a problem. Um, so there have to be practical ways of extending that. Um, and uh, in, the, in the 1930s, there was a you know, big committee came out with a whole set of these things. Um, and the triple point we've already talked about uh, as being one of them, that's gives us our 273.16 that we've talked about before. Um, but there are other fixed points that we can use on the scale as well. So about 30, 35 years later, um, we now get something different. So if we go to really low temperatures, so below the point at which helium has become uh, a liquid, um, then actually we just look at the vapor pressure of the materials, all right? So how much vapor there is compared to fluid, which will vary with temperature, just like evaporation rates from water and so on vary with temperature. So it does with liquid helium. Um, and then a little bit higher, we can use not the triple point of water this time, but the triple point of a gas uh, like neon, uh, which gives us a very reproducible temperature. And you can see there to what is that, six figures. Um, so a fairly precise pinpointing of a, of a temperature. Um, and then up from high, um, up again, we can use the triple point of hydrogen, so another very precisely measured uh, value to the freezing point of silver, which is a very sharp transition. Pure silver uh, solidifies or melts, depending on which way you're going, um, over a very narrow uh, temperature regime. So again, you know, at least to five figures, at nearly a thousand degrees centigrade, we can get a fixed point that we can use um, to calibrate uh, calibrate um, temperatures. Um, and then we we're into optical radiation, so this is where our parameters come in. So in fact, there's uh, there's something that we will talk about probably in three or four lectures' time um, called the Planck radiation law. So we'll talk about that later on. Uh, and that's what we'd use, for instance, to estimate the surface temperature of the sun, just from the colour of the photons that are coming off it. I'll get you to do that calculation. It's relatively straightforward. Um, but it's, you know, it's fun to be able to do it, I guess. Uh, and then we can use other things. Uh, magnetism varies with temperature, so we can use a change in magnetic susceptibility. Um, you know, there's a whole range of, of tricks we can play in a practical sense. Uh, in order to better measure temperature over, over huge ranges, and there are huge ranges available. So some of these are, uh, you know, outside our um, everyday realm, as it were. So you know, blue stars, for instance, are incredibly hot. Um, you know, we're really at the level of about 10 to the 9 degrees um, for one of those. Cooling down a lot when we get to a mainstream star like our own. Uh, our own sun and all the way down then through to you know the lowest temperatures that have been achieved uh, on the earth which are in the region of nano kelvin all right so really close to absolute zero but not quite there um, so as i say <laughs> very big range um, and then there are other significant temperatures so this three degree kelvin background temperature uh, to the universe is one of those that had a fairly sort of um, uh, game-changing effect uh, on cosmology uh, when it was first detected. There were um, theories around the Big Bang um, way before this was detected, 
Uh, and one of the consequences, of course, of that, if you have an initial energy content to the universe, and then you let it expand and cool for however many billion years, um, the, the, the average background temperature in the universe will be at a certain level. It's just cooling down through expansion. Um, and it was these guys, uh, Panzeus and, um, and Wilson, Robert Wilson's a very famous astronomer, you may well have heard of him, he's been involved in a lot of other stuff as well. Uh, but in the early days of using radio telescopes and trying to get the electrical noise down, obviously, so that they could detect radio emissions more clearly, uh, discovered that you know there was a background that corresponded to a noise from the universe associated with about 3 degrees Kelvin. And they couldn't do anything about it, and it was the same in every direction. Irrespective of where their telescope was pointing, they measured this basic background uh, level. And because it accorded with uh, the pre-existing theories of, uh, you know, associated with the Big Bang, of course, it had profound consequences in terms of supporting that, uh, that theory. So, you know, that's, I guess, a fairly important temperature.